Welcome back. Friday, June 18th, 2021. Yesterday, in signing legislation creating the federal holiday Juneteenth, President Joe Biden said this is, quote, first new national holiday since the creation of Martin Luther King holiday nearly four decades ago, close quote. My first thought, hell of a systematically racist country, that. The only holidays proclaimed in the last 40 years are two of them, and they're to honor and show respect for black Americans. Then I thought again, how many federal holidays are there? With Juneteenth, it turns out we now have 11, which gives us nearly 20% of our federal holidays dedicated to honoring and respecting black Americans. Keeping in mind, as Charles Murray reminded us yesterday, black Americans constitute 13% of the population. I'd happily add the 4th of July as a federal holiday that honors and respects black Americans as well. But right now, too much of the country would rather we make 1619 a holiday to commemorate slavery rather than the 4th of July, which commemorates freedom. I call that nostalgia de la buie, nostalgia for the mud. The best use of that phrase is Tom Wolfe's in his essay on Radical Chic, the fundraising party Leonard Bernstein threw for the Black Panthers. The analogy could not bore, be more appropriate either, given the times. Wolf there wrote, quote, It was at the party that a Black Panther field marshal rode up beside the North piano. There was also a South piano in Leonard Bernstein's living room and outlined the Panthers' 10-point program to a room full of socialites and celebrities who, giddy with nostalgia de la buie, entertained a vision of the future in which, after the revolution, there would no longer be any such thing as a two-story, 13-room apartment on Park Avenue with twin grand pianos in the living room for one family. My thoughts on Juneteenth are that I hope it can replace and repeal any further reference to the BLM movement, a movement based in and bathed in Marxism, whose money comes exactly from a future in which, after the revolution, there would no longer be any such thing as people able to give hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in donations to such a cause as BLM or any cause. Why do I think Juneteenth would be a positive exchange for BLM and its ethics for the exact opposite reasons Greg Moore in today's Arizona Republic, writes about Juneteenth. Mr. Moore writes today, quote, Today, slaves' descendants in America still must fight for basic equality and recognition. We're even fighting for that history to be taught in schools with code words like critical race theory, close quote. Now, hold on just a moment. Descendants of slaves in America are today fighting and must fight for basic equality and recognition who actually believe this believes this and and where is it possibly true call me myopic but i never thought the presidency or supreme court or senate or house of representatives or any other number of major offices and stations in life from hollywood to new york that creates billionaire billionaires amongst it, amongst its ranks was exactly basic equality and recognition but that is america and the potential and in many cases real black experience in america it is not a country that denies basic equality to anyone it conveys more freedom and equality to every single citizen and human being in this country than any other country on the face of earth or in the face of earth's history and i'm sorry you are not fighting for the history of slavery and its aftermath to be taught in schools fending off will-o'-the-wisps like the chimera of critical race theory? We've all been taught slavery and about it. And perhaps once, a time, once upon a time not so long ago, we were taught about it better than we are today as well. I was looking up the standard American history textbook used from the 1940s onward until about 20 years ago with updated editions, of course. In that out-of-date quote-unquote textbook, Slavery is mentioned over 80 times by my last recollection. And that is what we are told is an, what we are told is an out of date book that needs up supplanting to embrace the faults and fault lines in America, especially when it comes to the black experience, race and slavery in America. 80 times. Maybe with the correct learning about June 
19th, that junk thinking can be dispensed with as well. But we're not done here. Mr. Moore was not quite done. He continued in his piece, asking, why is Juneteenth important? He writes, well, it's only important if you think all lives matter. It's an odd construction. But if he's trying to tell us that the American thread running from the Declaration of Independence to the Emancipation Proclamation is better understood by Juneteenth, I'm all for it. I don't think that's what he's saying, though, all life mattering being some kind of modern-day racist dog whistle, as the left tells us. But Mr. Moore melds too much, too much ignorance, when he writes this in his op-ed today, quote, The 4th of July is really a celebration of American independence from British control, but whatever freedoms that conferred, did any of them employ? apply to enslaved Africans and their descendants. Close quote. Hmm. Did they? Well, as Tom West has written, every leading founder acknowledged that slavery was wrong. Slavery was legal and practiced in every state in 1776. But by the end of the founding era, more than 100,000 slaves had been freed by the outlong of slavery in seven of the original 13 states. Most important, the ground for the eventual total abolition of slavery was laid in establishment of the equality principle at the center of the American founding, as written and understood by Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Franklin Hamilton, Adams Washington, and others. May, might we listen to Frederick Douglass? Might we listen to what he thought about whether the Declaration of Independence and our founding? had something to say about slaves and slavery. In his famous speech on the 4th of July, often quoted out of context, here with Frederick Douglass on the founding and its meaning to the slave. Quote, I differ from those who charge this slavery baseness is based on the framers of the Constitution of the United States. It is a slander upon their memory, at least so I believe. The Constitution is empty from any design to support slavery for an hour. Fellow citizens, he goes on, there is no matter in respect to which the people of the North have allowed themselves to be so ruinously imposed upon as that of the pro-slavery character of the Constitution. In that instrument, I hold, there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing. But, Interpreted as it ought to be, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Read its preamble. Consider its purposes. Is slavery among them? Is it at the gateway? Or is it in the temple? It is none of the above. Well, I do not intend to argue that this question on the present occasion, let me ask if it not be somewhat singular that if the Constitution were intended to be by its framers and adopters a slaveholding instrument, why is neither slavery slaveholding nor a slave as a word anywhere found in the Constitution? What would be thought of an instrument drawn up, legally drawn up, for the purpose of entitling the city of Rochester to a tract of land in which no mention of land was made? So what is this business about the falsity of critical race theory? I can give it to you right here. I just did. CRT, critical race theory, would not have you read what I just quoted to you from Frederick Douglass. It would only quote other parts of that speech of his that constitute indictments of America. The portions Colin Kaepernick likes to tweet out around this time every year. A non-CRT curriculum, though, would give you the whole document and let you learn for yourself, think for yourself, and be critical for yourself using your own critical sk skills without the lens of the document from only one angle, the CRT angle. Seen this way as it is, I believe, is thus actually not expanding education. It's not an expansion of knowledge and learning, a cutting edge or a compass to vaster horizons by deploying critical race theory, it is nearly by its stinting design, embraced in its very name, attended by its cancel culture censorship certitude, a constraining and narrowing and contracting of viewpoints, angles, context, 
knowledge and learning. And finally, the idiotic hypocrisy we are supposed to swallow based on woke word salads thrown at us so self-contradictory as to be unbelievable and incredible if taken seriously in the repose of analysis rather than kinetically in the storm of crisis-type hysteria which they want from us. For example, after writing at the top of his op-ed today in the Arizona Republic, Mr. Moore writes, slavery's descendants still must fight for basic equality and recognition. But at the end of his op-ed, Mr. Moore writes this, quote, black people, broadly speaking, can live where we want, work where we want, go to school where we want, and aspire to be anything from a movie move." A movie mogul like Terry, excuse me, a movie mogul like Tyler Perry to the president like Barack Obama. How do you have a society that needs to fight for basic equality and recognition? Basic equality and recognition, as he says, when that society can, as he later says, live where it wants, work where it wants, go to school where it wants, and aspire to be anything from a billionaire to a president as it wants. How do you have her do that? You do not, because you cannot. It is irrational. Unless words don't mean anything anymore, or rather mean only in the service of propaganda what Humpty Dumpty or the speaker says the words should mean. I was put in mind of what George Orwell wrote in his essay, Politics in the English Language. He wrote, if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. And it seems to me an awful lot of language has corrupted an awful lot of our thought. Language spawned by neologisms birthed over the past six or so years. Neologisms like other woke, neo-fascist, tyrant, existential, systemic, inherent bias, whiteness, white privilege, Black Lives Matter, defund, targeting, equity. Those are big words, especially twisted as they are by knaves to make traps for fools. You can change, if not ruin a country with words like the foregoing. And pointing this out, ironically, is the thing that gets banned. So if Juneteenth is codified to do what it originally was intended to do, commemorate the enforcement and thus celebration of Abraham Lincoln's emancipation, Proclamation that would to me be a great thing as Abraham Lincoln was a great man and the Emancipation Proclamation was a great thing, taking us back to the understanding of 1776 and certainly not 1619 or any other year. If 1619 were our founding, please understand you don't get an Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation, after all, was based on the notion that all men were created equal, not that some men were created slave, as 1619 tries to establish. Oh, and the Emancipation Proclamation is dated by and to the writing of the Declaration of Independence 87 years prior. As K. James put it, Juneteenth, based on the Emancipation Proclamation, says that we as a nation recognize that the institution of slavery was an absolute conflict with our very core principles and values from our founding, and that Americans fought an entire war to get rid of that institution of slavery. And I would just remind the vast majority of states and Americans who fought that war, the vast majority were anti-slavery, they were in the Union, and the vast majority of states and Americans who fought that war, the vast minority, of states and Americans who fought that war, the vast minority in the Confederacy were pro-slavery. I have no idea where the majority was anti-slavery and the vast minority pro. I have no idea why we would want to bury that fact and promote the minority pro-slavery sentiment as naturally ours and representative of us when the majority, the vast majority anti-slavery sentiment actually always really was. I'm Seth. We'll be right back.